All right, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, we're running just a tad bit late, but uh, it, sometimes it's just things come up and um, thank goodness it was only a four minute delay. So uh, before we get started today, uh, I wanted to talk to you about the upcoming seminar that we're having, the Neural Reconnect is gonna be in Conroe, Texas. I do recommend that you go to barlowbrainandbody.com. You can register up here. Uh, where it says register now, uh, November the 11th and 12th. Uh, this will be all, all day Friday and Saturday. And uh, this will be a life-changing event. Everybody's always looking for a new niche or whatever. And um, I mean, I got, if you want to call it, tons of niches. And But the key thing is you've got to know the mechanism as to why these people are suffering with these problems. Uh, and, and if you don't know the mechanism, then what you're doing you're just again you're just putting people on a protocol and with the barlow brain and body institute you know our slogan is we know what we're doing and why we're doing it and that's the important part is the why because i can always tell when somebody doesn't know why they're doing something because they, everybody gets on a protocol you know three times a week for three months or three times a week for a month and they put them on a laser and then they put them on some type of nerve stimulator and they do an adjustment doing the flying seven or whatever, and they never actually listen to the person. They don't do a neurological exam. They don't know how to comprehend the neurological exam. And see, if you if you don't know the rules of the game, you can't play the game. You can fake it, but I'm not into faking it. I'm into changing people's lives. And this month already, I've had. I know we're wrapping this up at the end of the month, but see, I've already referred out two patients before they because they were beyond repair. These are people that's going to be under medical care for the rest of their life. And I'll ask you a question. When's the last time you referred anybody out of your clinic? And I do it quite often because, see, there's a, there's a certain group of people that belong in this clinic. If somebody just comes in with, with back problems or neck problems, I don't see them because I'm overqualified for that. I send them to another chiropractor. When's the last time you referred somebody in your town to another chiropractor? I would say most of you probably never. And then don't hold your breath expecting to get a thank you or uh, – you know, thanks for the referral, because that's just not going to happen either. But see, I have a certain level of, of, of what am I saying, acumen, certain level, of, certain skill set that I have that I deal with people with chronic neurological disorders. And when it comes to uh, frozen shoulder, uh, remember that this is just not a shoulder problem, that everything that's presynaptic and postsynaptic to this shoulder is going to decrease in its function. Now, one of the questions that was asked tonight uh, before we went on is uh, a lady asked, why did that one person can have a frozen shoulder and then later on in life, they could have a second frozen shoulder? And there are so many ways to answer this. So number one is if we look at the cervical spine, it's C5. C5 controls all the muscles in the shoulder except for three, okay? And that would be your pec, uh, pec major, latissimus dorsi, and the long head of the tricep. So if we have injury at C5 and we have a frozen shoulder from that, that what will happen is most people, uh, there, there's some studies that say about 50% of people within five years will actually have a frozen shoulder in the opposite arm. Okay. Now I've had, a, I've, I literally in the last couple of weeks, I've had two people come in here with the COVID jab. Uh, don't call it a vaccine because it's not that. So I'm not going to get into that whole deal with that. That's a, just a scientific fact and leave, you know, check your political views at the door. But the point is these are jabs. There's been no scientific long-term follow-up to that. I got into a slight, I wouldn't say argument, with, with a medical doctor talking about PRP, and it's like, well, there's been no double-blind studies for PRP, and I'm like, uh, there's been no double-blind studies for the vaccine that, you know, flu vaccine and the jab and the booster and all that, but yet, everybody's like, pull the shoulder up, stick it right there, doc. Now, with that being said, I've had two different patients come in with, you know, they got the COVID shot, the booster shot, and then they got the uh, flu shot. I'm like, man, I wonder what kind of toxic profile this person's having. And what happens is they get the, the vaccine in this shoulder and guess what happens? They can't move this arm anymore past 90 degrees. And lo and behold, they get the injection this arm and this shoulder right here is having a frozen shoulder. So we know at some level there are some vaccines that are actually, well, let me back up. There are some jabs that are causing that. And then you get this crazy cocktail of, you know, uh, 
a jab, a jab, a booster, and a booster, and you get the flu shot. Lord knows, nobody knows what that's going to happen. This has actually happened in the clinic twice in the last month in this clinic. Now, another one which I was actually going to talk about tonight is uh, is like uh, uric acid. Okay, well, what happened there? That's a byproduct, and your your kidneys are actually supposed to uh, take that and that byproduct, uh, uric acid. You can do this on a lab test and see if it's high or not. And this week, I've had a, uh, at least two people, again, come in. Uh, the magic number this week is not two. It just happened to things that I remember off the top of my head. The uric acid is higher. High. Now, that doesn't mean that we're just going to have shoulder pain. But remember, uric acid is supposed to be filtered by the kidney. So we want to look at the kidney function and see if you're not doing metabolic testing. There's no way you can know this. But see, the key thing is, is when you look at metabolic function with kidney, remember, it's not just frozen shoulder. There's other things associated with it, like your brain. And, and so when you look at the kidney, you also have to reverse engineer that and go, we, before we actually address the kidney, we have to look at the liver. And then to look at the liver, we have to look at the leaky gut. And so, so you got this chain of events, this leaky gut, that's pumping lipopolysaccharides into the liver, and the liver can't detox the body, and then it actually gets too, too many toxins in there. And then you start to get non-alcoholic fatty liver or alcoholic fatty liver. And, and then this, this uh, liver, during its phase one of detox, can't detox like it should. Uh, the way I explain it to the patient is, Think of it like having a sponge, and if you put water in the sponge, at some point it's going to get full, and then it's going to drip out, and that's kind of what happens with the stage one. It can drip out. You start to pump bile salts into the kidney, and then then we start to actually detox and sit it through the kidney and our skin. But so kind of went the long way around the barn with that. But the point is, uric acid. Okay, we have to get that. We have to filter that through our kidneys, and then we urinate that out. If we have too much uric acid in our system, this actually happens to collect in our joints. Okay, we can get stiff joints, not just in the thumb, I mean, just in the toes and whatever, but this can be in our shoulder, our neck, our hip. Okay, what about Parkinson's? Parkinsonism, okay? The first movement disorder is in the gut. Then we lose our olfactory because of alpha synuclein, and then it travels up the vagus nerve to our red nucleus, and then the red nucleus, what does it control? Well, it, it controls uh, our shoulders, okay, our proximal hip, hips and shoulders. So see here in this situation, somebody comes in with bilateral frozen shoulder or shoulder here or shoulder there, you know, are you just looking at the blinky light or are you actually treating the entire person? I'm gonna give you an example. I had a patient come in yesterday and I sent out a group text to some of the doctors that I'm in my consulting program. And I said, from a chiropractic standpoint, that you know that you move the needle somewhat in your community and in healthcare, when patients actually come into your clinic suffering from kidney uh, problems and constipation. I just had a patient come in yesterday morning and that was it, kidney and constipation. And no back pain, no neck pain, metabolic issue. Now he had neurological problems, don't get me wrong. I mean, he couldn't feel his feet. He had decreased circulation in his hands and feet, had balance problems, a cerebellar problem. And this is the key point that I want you to understand is that none of these problems happen in isolation. When you have inflammation and metabolic issues throughout your body, stop looking at the blinky light. That's, that's the street way of saying it because Nobody has these problems in isolation. If you have inflammation, you can have brain fog, neck pain, shoulder pain, heart problems, uh, digestive disorders, uh, and, and the list goes on and on. But see, if, if you're marketing to knee pain or frozen shoulder or peripheral neuropathy, and you're just actually trying to, quote, treat that symptom, you're doing your patients a huge disservice, and you're doing your bank account a huge disservice because you're not actually looking at the neurometabolic regenerative process to actually help these people get their life back. So, and, and then I went over this afternoon with a gentleman that's in his early 30s, bone on bone shoulder. He came in because of shoulder pain, frozen shoulder, okay? Neck pain, metabolic train wreck. And what we were able to do is turn this frozen shoulder into a $13,961 uh, $13, program without any exaggeration, without trying to sell something to somebody. And I told him, I said, look, we can work on your shoulder. We can work on your neck. The shoulder is $4,950, but you've got a lot of, a, a lot of metabolic disorders going on. 
So we get his blood work back and I go over it with it today. All right. So uh, number one, uh, when he comes in, he's got, got uh, two gluten genes. Secondly, they become activated. Third, he has a leaky gut, which he's actually pumping lipopolysaccharides into his bloodstream. And when you pump that lipopolysaccharide in, uh, I hadn't looked this up in a while, but you're activating interleukin-6, uh, natural killer cells, and there's interleukin, there's another interleukin. And you, I can't remember which one it is, cytokine, but you don't want these cytokines in your bloodstream, okay? Because they just wreak havoc on your system. Then we fast forward, this guy's 36 years old, and, okay, he's got a mild cardiopeptide autoimmunity. And he has autoimmune disorders uh, to his actual, uh, 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 the arthropedic, uh, I'm sorry, arthro, uh, um, arthrocytes. It's a peptide that's in your joints. But anyway, he's having an autoimmune disorder to his joint tissue. So again, if you have an autoimmune disorder to your joints, that can affect right shoulder, left shoulder, both neck, back, hip, whatever. But see, again, if you're just over here, just punch and play, banging bones. I mean, it's that stuff is, is 1960 stuff. I don't know if you noticed or not, but we've actually moved into 2022, okay? And I tell people this all the time, chiropractic didn't die in 1961, B.J. Palmer did, okay? So what's happening is you wanna know why people aren't in the game with you, why people don't respect you, why, or whatever. I hear that crap in chiropractic all the time. Well, you know, People are going to respect you at the level you expect to be respected. I mean, I went out to lunch today and met with a guy that, anyway, is a politician here uh, in, in Mississippi. But the point is, I went to this restaurant, uh, hadn't been to this restaurant in seven years. And I sat down the, today at lunch and the lady's like, oh, I hadn't seen you in here in a while. I see you on TV all the time. I refer people to you all the time. You know, when's the last time you went just to a restaurant in your town and that's happened? Okay. When's the last time you went to Walmart or Kmart or wherever and somebody goes, I know you and I am not lying. Yesterday I went uh, freaking 15 miles from here to get some gas before I went home. Uh, anyway, I got gas and the guy's like, I know you from somewhere. And I'm like, you probably see me on TV. And he goes, that's right. And uh, here's what he said. He's like, my brother's a chiropractor in Tupelo and I know you keep up the good work. Uh, and then where was I at the grocery store? And then today at lunch. So three times I just went out in the public and people stopped me. And it's like in, in the last 24 hours and said, hey, I know you. So see, again, and it's like, you know, people tell you it's like they bought my books. They bought one book, both books. And so, you know, what are you doing? You know, people are trying to go to the next seminar. And I'm saying I can show you how to become a number one bestseller. Okay. And, and I've done it with multiple doctors. Okay. You want a niche, I can give you a Niche. So, so again, let's get back to the shoulder. This shoulder, when it comes to the to the nervous system, the way this works here is, <clears throat> bear with me for just a second. In the uh, in in the cerebellum, we have what's called the flocular nodular lobe. This controls our eyes and eye movements, uh, and it controls your paraspinal muscle through the medial vestibular spinal tract, lateral vestibular spinal tract, and then we have what is called the vermis here, and then we have the paravermis, and then we have what is called the posterior lobe, all right, big whoop. So in here, we've got some, some nuclei. In this center part here, we have the vestigial nuclei. In this paravermal part, we have the globus and emboliform. That's gonna be critical for our shoulder movement. And over here, we have the dentate nucleus, okay? Now, when we get into this, and we're gonna go over this in detail, I'm gonna beat everybody up that comes to my seminars, uh, this weekend, and I've got two incredibly talented instructors that's going to be there with me this, uh, at this seminar, but I'm going to be spending the first four hours going over all the neurological aspects. Here's a clue. It's not just your shoulder, it's your autonomic nervous system, okay? And see, here's the deal. What is your autonomic nervous system control? Uh, let's see, I don't know, things like uh, uh, swallowing your food, uh, digesting your food, your stomach, your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas, uh, your small intestine, large intestine, but I didn't say gallbladder, uh, your ascending colon, transverse colon, your microbiome. And guess what's presynaptic to that? Your cerebellum. Every one of these lobes of the cerebellum, flocular nodular lobe, anterior lobe, posterior lobe, every one of these is presynaptic to your 
autonomic nervous system. So again, when this person has a frozen shoulder, it's not just a frozen shoulder, it's decreasing the autonomic response ipsilateral, contralateral brain, okay? So the way this is gonna work here, is if you just draw up the spinal cord, and this is where we come in from a chiropractic standpoint, Hopefully you can see this is, this is small and I apologize. In this back part of the spinal cord at the cervical medullary junction, you have what's called the accessory cuneate nucleus. And what this accessory cuneate nucleus does, it takes muscle spindles and go to tendon organs. And I'm going through a brief, brief uh, statement here, explanation. We're gonna go into this in detail at the seminar. This is a dorsal root ganglion. These muscle spindles and go to tendon organs, what they do is they fire into the spinal cord at lamina two, and what they do, I'll put a, put a, a red mark right there because this is gonna stop pain. It's gonna inhibit pain in health. In lamina two, uh, two, three, four, five, uh, is kind of your pain aspects of your, let's see where, okay, somebody put something on there for me. All right, and it's, so it's gonna inhibit pain. So see, when we lose this muscle spindle goji tendon, uh, <clears throat> afferent input into the cerebellum, then what this is going to do, because this, this muscle spindle is abnormally firing, no longer can actually put on the brake to pain. So what does it cause? It causes pain. This is why when we do this neural reconnect system, people get instantaneous range of motion and, and decreased pain. Why? Because we test this muscle, these muscles, to see if we're getting adequate or accurate muscle spindle activation. We're going to show you how to test every one of these muscles in the shoulder, in the neck, anterior and posterior in the neck, all the entrapment syndromes, but muscle spindles that go to tendon organs, their function is to inhibit pain at the spinal cord level. They're gonna fire up to the accessory cuneate nucleus and let's just talk about the shoulder because that's what we're here tonight. This is gonna fire to what is called <clears throat> our paraburmus. And the paraburmus, what this does, it takes uh, information, muscle spindles, go to tendon organs, and it's gonna process the information through three layers. Uh, it's going to be the molecular cell layer, Purkinje cell, and um, granular cell layer. It's going to process all this information. And just so you know, this is a trivial question. Uh, this and probably 75 cents to get you a bag of gluten-free chips. But it's a 40 to 1 ratio, which means there's 40 bits of afferent information going in and only one motor component going out. Okay, 40 to 1. All right. Now, see this. This, in this nucleus right here, when this information gets processed in the cortex, we have what is called the globose nebuliform. We have one of those on each side. These are nuclei. There's supposed to be an E right there. Now here's what happens. This system, this globose nebuliform, what it's going to do is it's going to fire to the contralateral, I'm going to use the red again, red nucleus, okay? Why is this important? Because see, this contralateral red nucleus is where? in the mesencephaline. What's in the mesencephaline? Substantia nigra pars compacta. What does it make? Dopamine. And dopamine uh, get, makes us happy because it's gonna fire through the ventral tegmental area into the prefrontal cortex. It's gonna fire to the basal ganglion to maintain adequate movement. It's gonna fire to our limbic lobe to keep the Neanderthal man, you know, squashed. You know, because the limbic man wants to, you know, run to it, run from it, kill it, have sex, with it or eat it, okay? And I know that's kind of commonplace, I guess, nowadays in America, but usually in most civilized societies, you know, you've got to be able to, your frontal lobe has to inhibit the function of the limbic band. So, and again, see, it's not just your shoulder, you start to get people with the limbic responses um, and cognitive disorder because see, this red nucleus is gonna fire to the thalamus, and from the thalamus, this is presynaptic to your brain. And see, we have to activate this entire system. So when we lose this, when we lose this shoulder, this loss of range of motion in our shoulder, this protein has a half-life about six to ten days, which means after after about 14 days, this system starts to atrophy. So all the muscles from 90 degrees to 180 degrees, see, all of those muscles atrophy. Now, see, we need to know. Where is the homunculus in the cerebellum? Well, the homunculus in the cerebellum is in the paraburmus. Where's the homunculus in the brain? My right shoulder is gonna to fire to my uh, left brain into this lateral aspect over here. And see, if you don't use it, you lose it. So now we've got a frontal lobe that's decreased in this function. So 
when when we actually start to rehab, now this is important. When we start to re rehab, if I'm over here doing delt, you know, uh, whatever this is called, uh, I work out at home, so I don't remember what all these are called, but you take, you know, 10 pound dumbbells and you bring your arms up to the side right here and you do your delt presses and you do your an anterior deltoid. Okay, and then we take it back and we can do our posterior deltoid where we take it up and back. All right. Now let me ask you this. Another way of saying this simplicity. If I'm if I'm working out my biceps, okay, bicep curls, am I actually working out? Here's the question. Am I working out the muscles? Am I working out the nerves to the muscles? Or am I working out both of them? And which one, if the answer is both. Which one does the study show that I'm actually working more? Am I working the ner nerves more or the muscles more? And the magic, the answer to this is when we're doing bicep curls or delt uh, lifts right here, whatever they're called, or a bench press, let's just use bicep curls. If we do the bicep curls, research shows that we actually are firing the nerves stronger than we are the, the biceps. Okay, so when we lose this, this muscle function here, uh, which is controlled by our deltoids, some other muscles. We have to lengthen the latissimus dorsi. Uh, the first 15 degrees of abduction is going to be our supraspinatus, which is fine, but we've got somewhat of a, uh, we've got the middle deltoid is going to be the ma major carrier here. But see, this C5 deltoid here is not just decreasing in its function, but also the nerve supply to that is atrophying as well. And that's extremely important to understand because, see, when these peripheral nerves atrophy, everything connected to that peripheral nerve will atrophy as well. It will break down in its function. Now, uh, when we when we actually draw this out, which we will go into grave detail uh, in at the seminar. All right, <clears throat> we have um, in, in our brainstem. All right, we have this thing in here that's called the reticular system. Reticular system is just a group of, of nerves. Uh, it's a net-like system that, that transverses our mesencephalon, pons, and medulla. All right, uh, this, this is part of your autonomic nervous system in here. This helps activate this system. So whenever we have this, con this cerebellum, all right, what's presynaptic to the cerebellum, uh, muscle spindles, and go to tendon organs. And see, this is the problem with this. Well, from a chiropractic standpoint, this, this pop and pray makes absolutely no sense to me because we have the science on our side now. So why do we not actually use the science instead of being a complete dumbass and using this pop and pray uh, and we hope something that works. I, I don't hope something works. I, I give people my all out. I give them everything that I have from a neurometabolic standpoint. But see, again, if you don't know the mechanisms, then you can't play the game. You're just popping and praying. So what's presynaptic to the cerebellum? Our muscle spindle go to 10 organs. What does this cerebellum fire into? The cerebellum is presynaptic to our reticular activating system. This reticular activating system is going to activate uh, part of our, what is called the uh, nucleus tractus solitarius or uh, uh, nucleus solitarius. We have one on the right and left side, okay? Uh, this nucleus tractus solitarius also, here's the crazy thing, this actually takes information from your internal organs, okay? So we take inf information by internal organs, which is presynaptic to the uh, uh, nucleus solitarius. Uh, and from this nucleus solitarius, this is going to fire into what is called our hypothalamus. Now, the basal ganglion is presynaptic to the nucleus tractus solitarius as well. So see, we take all of this information from our organs that's firing into your nucleus tractus solitarius that's presynaptic to the presynaptic, uh, pre, uh, the nucleus tractus solitarius or nucleus solitarius. Your, uh, the, your cerebellum is presynaptic to this. So see, this input from here is gonna fire from the nucleus tractus solitarius and it's gonna fire up to the hypothalamus. Now, with this nucleus tractus solitarius, we also have what is called the, the nucleus ambiguous. And we have in this in here, we have the cranial nerve five, which is also called our spinal trigeminal tract. Why am I telling you all this? Because the dorsomotor nucleus of 10, aka the vagus nerve, 
okay? Okay, the vagus nerve takes all of this information from the nucleus tract solitarius, spinal uh, trigeminal tract, nucleus ambiguous, and what does it do? It fires down and controls parasympathetic, parasympathetic autonomic function. Why am I telling you this? The reason I'm telling you this is because the muscle spindles and go to tendon organs that are presynaptic to the globus and emboliform, which can, is, is the uh, mechanism that controls and coordinates muscles from your shoulder, right? The cerebellum is presynaptic to the nucleus tractus solitarius, which controls your autonomic system and your hypothalamus, and it fires into the reticular activating system, which controls dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine as well. So it's not just a frozen shoulder, okay? It's everything postsynaptic and presynaptic to this frozen shoulder. So see, you have people that's like this and you ask them, it's like, well, tell me about your focus, attention, concentration. Tell me about your um, uh, anxiety, uh, depression, insomnia. And they're like, I've got all of that, okay? And then how would you be able to connect that? Well, there's uh, several different ways, but see, if you understand here, that the cerebellum is presynaptic to this reticular activating system. The reticular activating system helps activate our autonomic nervous system and also dopamine, uh, serotonin, and norepinephrine, epinephrine to keep us awake at night, or keep, not keep us awake at night, keep us alert and awake during the day. And then the brain stem, the, the cerebellum is presynaptic to your nucleus tractus solitarius and uh, multiple other areas. I'm trying to keep this as simple as I can. And this nucleus tractus solitarius is presynaptic to our hypothalamus, which is going to affect endocrine system and endocrine function. We're going to take this nucleus ambiguous, nucleus tractus solitarius, and cranial nerve 5, which is all of this is presynaptic to the basal ganglion. And then your, your dorsal motor nucleus of 10 is going to make sense of this, and it's going to fire down through this autonomic parasympathetic output to control heart, lungs, digestion, stomach, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, um, uh, large intestines, small intestines. Um, and when we say small, large intestines, it, it controls your ascending and transverse colon. All right. So again, stop just looking at the blinky light. Stop just thinking this is a frozen shoulder because these people are coming into your clinic with more than just a frozen shoulder. Remember, nothing in neurology uh, is in isolation. And if you think it is, then you don't know, as we say in the South, you don't know the ship from Shinola when it comes to the actual nervous system and metabolic care. None of these systems act in isolation of each other. And if you think you do, it's because you think it does because you don't understand the mechanism, you don't understand the rules, and that's why it's so important to get to my seminars or at least purchase the online version to the seminars. There's nothing like being at the seminar. I'm just telling you that now. So I will open up the, the floor for any questions that we have. I've got about two and a half minutes. So if you have any questions, just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the question. So I've answered every question anybody has about uh, the shoulder and frozen shoulder and the brain and how it's presynaptic to the uh, brain stem. Uh, we've got about two minutes and 10 seconds, so far away. <clears throat> we've got 16 people on here. Nobody's got a question. So one of the leading experts in neurometabolic care in the United States. Brad, if you have a question, go ahead. <clears throat> All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight, and I hope you learned something, and uh, there will be a lot more. It's going to be a lot more intense. There's going to be uh, a lot of hands-on. By the time you leave this seminar uh, coming up in Conroe, Texas at the ErgoFlex Technology, you will, you will actually know how to fix a frozen shoulder. You'll know how to market to it, fix it within two visits. Uh, you're going to know how to address the entrapment syndromes uh, in the neck. Uh, it's called a plexopathy, and there's three entrapment syndromes there, each peripheral nerve, your median ulnar nerve, and your radial nerve. Each one of these have three entrapment sites from the shoulder to the distal uh, termination. So I want to thank everybody for being on here tonight, and I'll see you guys next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Barlow. Absolutely.